I know fitness is important, but I don't have time to keep up with all the fads and celebrity workouts that come and go. I need something backed by real science that will get real results and fits into my schedule. Caliber has been a lifesaver. It's a science-based fitness coaching program covering strength, nutrition, and healthy habits, completely customized to my needs and abilities. All I did was fill out their online assessment, and Caliber did the rest. The best part is, I'm not in it alone. Caliber paired me with an expert personal trainer who checks on my progress and keeps me motivated and on track. And I'm not the only one getting results. Caliber is top-rated on Trustpilot with 4.9 out of 5 stars. On average, members achieve a 20% or better improvement in their body composition by week 12 of the program. Start a science-based fitness program you'll actually stick with. Get $100 off at CaliberStrong.com slash podcast. That's CaliberStrong.com slash podcast. This is a more than just podcast production. Welcome to Spotcast Season 6, Episode 9. My name is Tim Mitchell. I am in Toronto, Ontario. I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kuline in Mississauga, Ontario. Hello there, kids. Ladies and gentlemen, direct from Seattle, Washington, it's Jaime Lopez Jr. <laughs> How's it going? It's going good. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, so no fact check. We were perfect last week again, except except for one minor fact check. We said that Star Wars would never make another theatrical release movie last week. <laughs> well, we speculated. We speculated. Uh-huh. We were mistaken. Mm-hmm. Times three. Yeah, based on the uh, the success of the solo movie, which I still say was okay. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yes, that, that, that was the trigger. They're like, now is the time to capitalize on the hotness of Rise of Skywalker and Solo. Well, there you go. That's that's your lead into your, that's your segue to your first story, John. Well, there we go. So into the headlines we go, and yeah, it was a Star Wars bonanza out of uh, Celebration Europe uh, recently. We got a lot of news on a lot of things, including new movies, new shows, shows ending, new characters. It was uh, yeah, it was a ton of stuff. So let's start at the top. Uh, new movies. We're getting uh, a bunch of new stuff, including the return of Ray. You mean the uh, Ray turn? The yes, the Ray turn of uh, Ray turn of the Jedi. If they don't call it Ray turn of the Jedi, I think they really are missing an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we're getting Daisy Ridley, Ridley back in a uh, new theatrical movie set 15 years after the events of Rise of Skywalker. Uh, not enough time. And it is going to be directed by Charmaine Obeid Shinoy, who is the uh, one of the directors for the Ms. Marvel show that was on Disney+. Plus. And uh, it's going to revolve around Rey building up a Jedi Academy, a la Luke. How could it go wrong? Hmm. What could possibly go wrong? <clears throat> so what, she tries to murder one of her students who's a relative in his sleep? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that would be nutty. Milk. That would be nutty. And then just, like, quits and walks away and hides on an island for 30 years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, are you guys excited about this one? Do you need more Ray? Ray Skywalker, for the record. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like the character, and, and I guess, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 you know, as you know me, anything with Star Wars on the label is pretty going to be going to be watched and possibly liked partially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me, I'm not necessarily pumped to see uh, a movie with Ray, but I'm not opposed to it either. Especially now that they seem to have learned that having a plan is a really good <laughs> idea when you're making these multi-billion-dollar movies. So, uh, given that uh, Filoni is is involved and you know the plan seems to be going you know not 100 percent perfect but pretty well for everything new that's been coming out with the tv series and stuff mm -hmm. like i have to believe that unlike the last time it was like you know they went on some drunken bender and said you get a movie you get a movie you get a movie and uh, we'll just pretend it's a trilogy um yeah i think they've i think they found a path forward so um you know continuing with with ray makes sense uh i think daisy ridley did a, a fine job given what she had um, so it, it's not unreasonable and, uh, you know, she's got the sacred texts, the sacred Jedi texts. So true. Uh, she can start anew. Yeah. Trilogy in four parts. <laughs> yeah, it could be, it could be. Yeah. I mean, 
I, I don't think Daisy, Daisy Ridley was the problem with that the sequel trilogy, and I don't think uh, her character was a problem, and I don't think that, you know, there certainly there were some things that were very redeeming in that trilogy. Uh, yep. She was not a problem. I would I, I look forward to knowing what her further adventures are. I'm just going to pretend that I'm meeting her for the first time. Well, and they, but they also introduced a whole bunch of new characters in the last in that last go round. They had the oh, the Felicity actor, I've forgotten actor, actress, I've forgotten her name. Um, as the you know the Poe Dameron, Carrie Russell, Carrie Russell, that's her. Thank you. Yeah, and and the other lady that was um, there for I guess for um, uh, Finn to you know be associated with. Oh yeah, because the yeah. yeah the, the yeah. other former stormtrooper. See, person, now you're just right? dragging up the past. Can we? I think we need to move on from this because you're going to drag me back into the quagmire. Well, I mean, they already brought back the little the little guys you didn't like that uh, you know that fixed up uh, C three PO, right? So yeah, yeah. Well, who knows? Yeah. Maybe Babu Frick will play a key role in the you know, and the Azalians will play a key role in the rise of Ray. Who knows? Well, they're already playing a key role in Mandalorian. That's true. It's true. We'll, we'll get we'll get into that later in the episode. All right. Mm -hmm. The other two movies they announced are uh, one, James Mangold, who is uh, just wrapping up directing Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Of course, he did Logan, probably one of the better Fox X products, uh, is going Mm -hmm. to be doing a extreme prequel. This is going to be set in a galaxy far, far away, an even longer time ago, because it is going to be focused 25,000 years before the events of Star Wars. And it's going to focus on the first ever Jedi to use the Force. Hmm. Now, I must say, as far as prequels go, the opportunity for them to sub-reference and that are, like, out the window. So I think this could work. Okay. Like, they're not going to be like, oh, there's somebody's grandma. Like, it's 25,000 years before. Hopefully this is all new territory. Yeah, like House of the Dragon was far enough back that it wasn't, you know, there were some some family lines you could follow because it is a little closer than what you just described but it's largely a very different set of folks you don't lose the the drama of where things are going doesn't suffer from traditional prequel stuff and would you say twenty five thousand years before yeah yeah Yeah. there you go so yoda Uh, was just being born (laughs) (laughs) yeah and leonard (laughs) nimoy was too that's right yeah uh and the third movie that they have announced is Dave Filoni himself, he who has risen with us through Clone Wars and Rebels and Bad Batch and now The Mandalorian, is going to be directing the culmination of the Star Wars overlapping Disney Plus universe in a theatrical movie. So I'm surprised that no one's done this before in this way. Made that like, hey, if you want to find out how it ends. You have to come to the theater. Oh, really? Hmm. I'm sure it's been done in some capacity. I'm just not thinking of it off the top of my head, but... Oh, I can think of, I can think of one that, that's going to be... We're going to talk about a little bit later, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've seen jumps. Obviously, the Star Trek universes have jumped from, from TV to... But not in this sort of way. I mean, it seems to me like the idea is we're going to get the crossover from Mandalorian, Ahsoka, Skeleton Crew... Um, who knows what other properties they'll have added into that mix by then. Who knows? Rebels, Clone Wars, uh, Bad Batch. All those things are going to apparently culminate in this sort of grand ending. Mm -hmm. I mean, seems like a pretty smart idea. If you're going to pull people back into Star Wars in the theaters, why not use the stuff that they're watching in their homes every week? That's right. That's what we did with Star Trek, right? We watched Star Trek at home, and then we're like, Star Trek, a movie? That'll be great. 15 minutes of flybys yeah. later, we weren't sure, but... Yeah. Well, there's a case mm-hmm. exactly where where the, the, the stories continued on the big screen, right? So... Yeah. I mean, I guess the most direct one would be something like um, Wrath of Khan, right? Because that actually picked up a story thread from the series True. years before, yeah. right? And this is... Yeah. I think the idea is that they're going to tell us more stories than Disney+, Plus, and then they're going to culminate it in this sort of grand, you know, Star War on the silver screen. So pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you all can just get your Photoshop warmed up and ready. Start cutting out Dave Filoni's face so you can put it right on top of the Thanos. I'll do it myself image and just (laughs) Photoshop his head on there. And there you go. That's the movie right there in a nutshell. Yeah, Um, we got 
our first look at Ahsoka as well. Uh, we got right. our tr- first trailer for the new Ahsoka series, and uh, they also announced when it's coming. It's coming in August, which is pretty cool, and you know, uh, both really temptingly close and also still too far away because I'm very excited for that series. And man, that was just a basket full of Easter eggs. That was just uh, it was a hilarious timing. They came out on Easter Easter weekend because it was just Easter eggs <laughs> everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If for fans of the cartoon in particular, it was just, you know, your cup runneth over. It was filled with a lot of Rebel stuff, Clone Wars stuff, and, you know, it really uh, brought a lot of stuff together. You know, yep. we got to see a more grown-up version of Sabine from Rebels, part of the, the Ghost Crew, played by Natasha Lee Bordizo. Uh, we got to see Hera. Uh, Sindula, played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead from Scott Pilgrim. That's pretty awesome. Uh, Mm -hmm. Of course, she's uh, her partner in life and uh, her baby daddy is uh, Ewan McGregor, so that's pretty funny. Right. Yep. Uh, And yeah, I mean, we even got from behind, but we got Lars Mikkelsen as playing Grand Admiral Thrawn. So, that was... I'm, I I literally had shivers going up my spine. I'm like, I can't believe this is all real. They're, like, we were there on Lothal. Like, it was just, it was. I mean, as I say, I'm, I'm a huge Rebels head, and this was this was awesome. Mm-hmm. Did you guys have similar excitement at that? Well, only because you prepped us for all this stuff. I mean, <laughs> Hera was a bit of a surprise, but but Hera was a surprise, but then not a surprise. Um, but I mean, the person playing Hera obviously is a surprise, but. Yeah, I think you, you had us ready for Thrawn to be on the screen, so I wasn't surprised when I saw him, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and with all the references he's got, got a, another shout-out on, on this week's Mandalorian, which we'll talk about in yeah. a bit. But, yeah, mm-hmm. clearly mm-hmm. this has been in the offing for, for a while now. They've been... This, this specter of Thrawn has been looming. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're even being Doctor Who over for this one, too, right? That's right. He's coming Star. back. David Tennant, uh, who, who did a voice during Rebels, is going to come back and do the same... Uh, um, same, vo- same voice for the same robot again. Oh, it's a robot. Oh, I see. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And yeah. the in the trailer, you can see, you see the same robot. It's a uh, um, it was Clone Wars or Rebels? I may be getting them mixed up. I th- maybe it was Clone Wars. But uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah. Even even more nerdiness on your nerdiness. Yeah. Uh, we got a little bit of Mandalorian, but nothing really too much that was revelatory. Especially as we're down to the last couple of episodes of this season. We got to see mm-hmm. the cast of the Acolyte, which is the the series that we knew was coming. Uh, Leslie Headland is is leading that one. We knew that it was coming, but now it's it's a little more concrete. They did announce that it's coming uh, in 2024, and um, they did show some footage at the event that has not yet made the light of day. <laughs> They're calling it Frozen meets Kill Bill, which uh, I okay, sure, yeah. <laughs> We were just joking last week about Frozen having a live action film. Yeah. There you yeah. Go. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, a Wookiee mm-hmm. Jedi apparently is going to be part of this show. That's that, I'm, I'm in. Definitely uh, going in the trailer for, to see that. Mm. Yeah. They at the event also showed a trailer for Andor. I don't know if either of you saw it online. There was somebody's surreptitiously recorded footage of this trailer that they have not released that showed a few. Clips. It, it seemed very teaser trailery. It was very much, you know, a few people's faces. All all the players are back from Andor, and uh, yeah, I mean that was again exciting. But we know that that's not coming till August of 2024. So another, you know, year and four or five months. So it's still quite a ways away. Uh, and I don't think you really need to twist any of our arms to be in line for that one already. Yeah. Did you see that they did show an extended uh, video of Ahsoka as well? Um, Because somebody filmed it from their seat. You could sort of see that the the screen was on an angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were extra bits in there that weren't in the the published trailer. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you go to the event, I guess you get your your money's worth. Both. They also showed, introduced the cast, made up of a bunch of different uh, kids primarily, along with Jude Law for Skeleton Crew. Again, we knew this one was coming uh, later this year, but uh, interesting to get a little bit more from that. And uh, of course, that one's being done by John Watts, who did the newest Spider-Man trilogy. So he's he's got a pedigree that we, we've enjoyed his work. Um, so that's kind of neat. And 
they also showed us a trailer for Visions, Star Wars Visions Season 2, which was pretty cool, I think. It's interesting that this time they're not just doing Japanese animation studios, they're doing worldwide studios, so... I don't know if you hmm. guys saw the highlights of the Ardman version of this. No, is that the Wallace yeah. and Gromit? Uh, yeah. Folks? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the same people who did Wallace and Gromit and uh, and you know Chicken Run and all those those great uh, sort of stop motion animation style movies uh, are doing one of the shorts for Star Wars Visions, which is apparently coming May fourth. So May the fourth will be with you. And it's coming out in just a couple of weeks. But yeah, interesting. I mean, it, it was definitely a lot more eclectically. Um, artistic. It wasn't necessarily just, yeah, uh, anime. Right. I mean, I know you're big into that stuff. What, uh, what did you take away from that? There's just a lot of different t- styles of art in there. Yeah, I, I definitely picked up on the, the Wallace and Gromit one. I liked the, um, I don't know, wool yarn uh, mm. texture for one of them. So there's yeah. like a lot of different media types in there. So that's that's really neat. It, uh, I liked Visions the first go around. It looks like I'm going to enjoy it this go around too. Yeah, I think it's it's a great idea to just let these people play in your in your toy box, right? Like what a yeah. what a novel idea, and it's it's so simple and yet it's so successful. It's so so elegant and works so well. To be honest with you, there's a lot of trailers that came out this weekend, and it's it's kind of hard to keep them all straight, you know? Oh, yeah, I get it. I get it. Like, honestly, it felt like at a certain point on, on the weekend, it felt like the Star Wars fire hose had been turned on and jammed in your mouth. You're like, I, I can't have any more, <laughs> yeah. but we've got yeah. one more. So uh, the Bad Batch, we got uh, uh, a little bit of news about that, that the third season, of course, is coming. We knew that, obviously, leaving on a... On a uh, cliffhanger like it did this last season but we also found out that the next season is the last season they're gonna wrap up the bad batch with season three so i don't know how to feel about that one i think i could see why the story needs to wrap up in three seasons and there was certainly a little bit of fat in this last season Mm -hmm. i am only saddened by the fact that i really enjoy that portion of the star wars canon i like the animated series i enjoyed clone wars very much i love rebels and bad batch has been really enjoyable and i hope that it's not off the table for them to do an ongoing series like that again right yeah i think for this particular uh group of characters it does thematically make sense that their story arc would come to an end like they were already leaning towards you know maybe we stop doing the soldier thing maybe we give omega a nice you know more normalish uh, stable life instead of flitting about from you know mercenary job to mercenary job so um it, it makes sense to me that they would do that although it is kind of uh you know fun to watch them week after week getting into trouble yeah yeah well hopefully that gives them a good strong sometimes it's good when you know you have that last season you you do cut some of the fat out and you do really focus on what matters and what stories you really want to tell with those characters. So I'm hoping for a really strong last season that goes out with a, with a bang. Cause the, the I think that's been a lot of fun. All right. Yeah. Well, speaking of trailers, we got another great drop earlier this week. We got the first teaser trailer for the Marvels, which is theoretically a, a sequel to captain Marvel. The, uh, the, uh, I don't, know, I don't know how to describe it. I guess it was sort of, you know, lukewarm space adventure with Brie Larson a few years ago. It was, it was good. It was enjoyable, but I, I don't think it was... I, I wouldn't put it in my top tier of Marvel movies, but I, I wouldn't necessarily put it in the bottom either. It's it's sort of somewhere in the middle lower tier, I guess. Mm-hmm. But in terms of characters, I mean, she, she was important in Endgame, right? For sure. And honestly, I think she was great, but it just, d- d- not all of it worked, I think, for me. But this one looks really fun. It, uh, of course, we get to see her back, of course, as the titular Captain Marvel. Uh, we also get to see Ms. Marvel, Kam- uh, Kamala Khan, who, we, of course, we saw on the Ms. Marvel Disney Plus series. And we also get to see Monica Rambeau, theoretically Spectrum, uh, in the... Mm-hmm. Uh, which is her comic book character name in right. uh, of course she was from WandaVision. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how this all comes together. But th- yeah, I thought this looked light and fun and just good chemistry already that I like between the characters and, and some of the supporting pieces. What uh, would you guys think of this trailer? 
Yeah, it looked pretty pretty fun. Is there, I was going to ask though: is there, is there only three Marvels like in, in that group, or? Well, it, it's funny because they call it, it the Marvels, but you kind of need to know a little bit about the Marvel. Like it's Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel, and Spectrum. And- <laughs> well, that's the thing. In in the comic books, if you're a, a, a fan of the comic book characters, you would probably know that uh, Spectrum has gone by a number of names over her career. Monica Rambeau as a superhero. And initially, her first alias was Captain Marvel. And oh, okay. so for MCU fans, comic book fans... Of course, being called the Marvels makes perfect sense. Here, doesn't make a lot of sense because... They've never referred to Monica and Rambo in any context at all using the term Marvel. So it'll be interesting to see how they try and work that in. I'm sure there will be some kind of explanation. But yeah. Well, there did, did seem to be sort of a multiverse kind of flipping back and forth, right? Because. Well, I'm I mean, not you get sure. That from the trailer. Yeah, right? I'm not sure if it's a multiverse thing or if Portal it's a. Portal or. Yeah, across yeah, the like universe kind of swapping thing. Swapping or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it'll be interesting to see how they, how they pull it together. But it does look fun. Like, it looks. It looks very likable, which I think was how mm-hmm. I felt about the Ms. Marvel series, and it's it's certainly how I feel about all three of those actresses. Right. And the two older ladies, you know, you know putting down the younger one, she's like, are we a team? And they're like, uh, no, we're not a team. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I like her energy, and I, uh, it's, it's yeah. fun, because she was a fun character on her own and, and working amongst her peers on her own show, but as that sort of scrappy, you know, teen slash 20 something hero versus the you know the more mature uh performers i think it's it's going to make for some fun you know fish out of watery kind of you know rookie versus the experienced cops kind of deal right yeah yeah it's it it feels like it's got a a pretty good tone to it because you're right you've got a character who has punched thanos in the face but another (laughs) character who is like you know scared to kiss a boy kind of thing like it's Yeah, it's like your problems are not my problems, kid. Like we're we're not a team. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting was uh, the return of the the alien cat, the sort yes. of terrifying alien cat, and in the trailer, a horrifying number of alien cats, or I presume to be alien cats. So <laughs> they've got like a little army. How with this one? Yes. You know, yeah, if, if one can do all that damage, what could like I don't know twenty of them or whatever that was coming down the stairs. Yeah, yeah, what is it? I think they call them flurkins. 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 There you go. Flurkins. Yeah. That. That. Uh, and that's the. Of course, we we learn in the in the Captain Marvel movie that's actually how Nick Fury lost his eye, which is hilarious. But oh, really? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the uh, Marvel verse, Deadpool three. We got news this week on a, a bit of casting. weren't sure where we were going to be as far as who they were going to bring back. If they're weaving Deadpool into the Marvel universe, how they're going to do this stuff. Well, they announced this week that uh, we're going to... We had already found out last week that um, Karan Sony's character, Dopinder, who was the taxi driver from part one and and the the fun supporting character, and Leslie Uggams' Blind Al, who of course is is Deadpool's Wade's roommate, are coming back. We got news this week from Deadline that Marina Baccarin is coming back as Vanessa, and Mm -hmm. Stefan Kapit Kapicic is coming back as the uh, voice slash body model actor for Colossus. So it sounds like they're really just kind of going for it. They're bringing bringing the whole gang from the Deadpool movies back together. So there'll be you know a continuation of that you know the the the, the silliness and the rivalries with those characters, and then uh, yeah, mixing that in with the actual MCU. So it should be interesting to see how they bring all this together, especially given Colossus is. An X Man, a real X Man, <laughs> you know. Yeah, this, and yeah, it looks good. In He's theory, this is the first X Man to appear in a Marvel movie. Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah, I like that they're calling it a threequel too, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the the rumors on the internet are to be to be believed. The the there's a lot of speculation that it is going to be a real multiversey kind of thing where it does cross over multiverses, and that's how they sort of bring it all together. So this will hopefully be a little bit more of that. How do they get the things they like out of that? Not unlike they did with Doctor Strange, right? They pulled some of those characters from some of the other properties and sort of jammed them all together. So we'll see how it comes together. But uh, I'm, I'm, I think the chemistry between all of those actors was so good in part one, pretty good in part two. I, I'm hoping that we, we recapture the magic with part three. Mm-hmm. And speaking of trailers and news, we got stuff from 
Max. Oh, HBO Max, you say? No, no, no. No. Just Max. Max. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, first I'm going to start with Jaime. Are you pr- a proud uh, user of Max? Not yet, because they did send an email saying that, uh, I don't know, sometime in like middle of May, I think. Yeah, the 23rd, I, be, I think it said, yeah. Yeah, I will be seamlessly migrated over, including all my watch lists and everything. I think if you have an app on your device, uh, like your smartphone uh, and iPads and stuff like those, I think will just change over. But I got the impression that the TV stuff, you might have to go in and download a new one. It was Mm. not 100% clear. So odds are pretty good that I'll, you know, spend that day looking around to be like, all right, every device, fire up HBO Max. What does it tell you to do? Oh, (laughs) is there a Max app? Like, did it seamlessly change and that sort of stuff? Yeah. So Yeah. Not uh, like I sort of get as a little side note here. They explain like, oh, Max, because HBO has just like a little too adult flavor to it no okay i can kind of see that right it's like you know you know boobs and drugs over here right it's not like a like a hardcore pornography it's not like a oh this is the the closed off section of the video rental store kind of area that only adults can go into it's not quite that bad but it's also not quite you know kitty friendly and they have claimed that they want to push more of the cartoon network stuff which i guess makes sense but in that case Why would you choose the generic Max when (laughs) Warner Brothers is sitting right there and like, yeah, oh, Warner Brothers, what do they make? Stuff like, you know, adult movies, not like porn movies, but like, you know, adult facing movies. Oh, do they also own the Looney Tunes that are very family friendly? I'm like, it was right there. Why would you come up with a new name that's generic? As well as they own DC, which people are familiar with and kids are familiar with, and they own Harry Potter for that purposes. So yeah, mm-hmm. it uh, mm-hmm. it's a strange choice. It's a very strange choice. But here we are in the world of Max. So with this announcement of this changeover, also came a flood of what is going to be this great content on Max, which uh, here will theoretically trickle down to Crave in Canada. We are getting another Game of Thrones spinoff. We're getting A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, The Hedge Knight, which, of course, is based on a property already existing from George R.R. R. Martin. So uh, this is uh, Sir Duncan at the Tall and his squire, Egg. And uh, a lot of people who are fans of this stuff, I have not personally read this portion of the uh, Westeros universe, but apparently it's quite popular. So I'm curious to know more about that. And I wonder if it'll be out concurrent or after we wrap up the house of dragon series because they aren't really clear on the timeline for this Hmm. yeah i got some info online i'm not an expert but i i got the impression it was maybe the first aegon targaryen yes like the one that they refer to in house of the dragon as the one who conquered and gave them their uh, their lineage but i I don't know if that's actually true because they weren't super explicit on where this fits in the timeline. Actually, I think it's supposed to be the... You remember the old maester who was on the wall, who made friends with John when John gets sent, sent to the wall, when John Snow gets sent to the wall, mm-hmm, and he mm-hmm. befriends the old maester who's working there? I believe yeah. that's, that's Egg, oh. as an old man. Oh, okay, okay. I, I may be mistaken, I gotta be honest, it's been a while since I've delved back into the Game of Thrones mythology, and I haven't reread the books in I can't tell you how long, but I... I believe that is the the titular egg. All right. Other stuff they announced. Rick and Morty the anime coming to Max and Adult Swim later this year. That was a random one. Uh, Gremlins. They're doing a Gremlins cartoon also coming to Max. Sure. Why not? We're getting more Tiny Toons. I mean, I love Tiny Toons when I was, uh, you know, a teenager, I guess. But sure, okay. I thought we knew Tiny Toons was coming out, but we talked about that months ago. Tiny Toons? I don't remember that. I remember there being an announcement about oh, maybe, Animaniacs. Animaniacs, Animaniacs oh, maybe came back, okay. but aren't they the same thing? <laughs> well, no, blue, no. Blue, blue Rabbit and Pink Rabbit. If you remember yeah. seeing those character no. designs, okay. those were the Tiny Toons. Yeah. The, okay, I don't know. Yeah, not my Bugs Bunny. <laughs> no, they are not. <laughs> No, they are not. 
Yeah, and uh, the other news that really kind of uh, everyone was jumping on is something we talked about on our last episode. So they confirmed that they are working on the Harry Potter TV series, and they've confirmed that it is a faithful adaptation of the seven Harry Potter books. And they expect the series to last more than a decade. Wow. So, strap in, because (laughs) those... Books, which I have said before, and again, I'm, I have my own issues. We talked about them last week with J.K. Rowling and her views. I enjoyed those books for what they're worth. However, the further into the series you go, the more that woman needed to have an editor say, please stop. The, <laughs> the fourth book is so wildly overwritten, and the sixth book as well, which I enjoy, but is also wildly overwritten. I guess the they're going to... The fourth is... Uh, Goblet is of Golden... Fire. Gobble of Fire, yeah, that yeah. was a crazy one, yeah. Just, I mean, they could have made two movies at the time. There was so much content that's, that yeah, they that's, left yeah, out. The whole, the whole health, el- health, health thing. And, yeah, 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 but, yeah. So yeah. I guess the idea by announcing it's going to be a faithful adaptation of the books means the way they roped her in was by saying, hey, instead of trying to jam your 700-page books into a two-hour movie, we're going to make them into a season or two of this series. Yeah, 20 episodes, yeah. Yeah, who knows? But apparently this is this, is, 20, this yeah. is what they're working on. So uh, now that it is theoretically real, how are you feeling about that one? Same. Yeah. We'll see. We'll have to see how it goes when we start watching it. I mean, there's so many other shows to catch up on, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still very conflicted by it. And maybe, maybe time will heal wounds. Maybe she will finally uh, get her head out of her but but I, I don't know. I'm still really struggling with that one. The last story being in two parts was was a bit much, and then you know two like you know and and six months apart. You know, like in terms of watching that one. I mean, the book was okay, but mm-hmm. the book was deep and, and had a lot in it. But uh, yeah, just uh, having having that movie split into two movies was was a bit a bit much, right? Well, especially because um, the first movie was so grim, dark, and mm-hmm. slow, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, As part of this announcement, they also announced that J.K. Rowling herself will be an executive producer on the TV series, which means that she will have a lot of say, which if you're, again, if you're somebody who is a fan, a faithful fan of the books, that means that hopefully she'll bring more insight and add more layers to it, which again, for canon is is lots of fun. However, um, as I've mentioned before, she can kiss my butt. So (laughs) that's a different matter. Yes. Speaking yeah. of spinoffs, Stranger Things is getting an animated series on Netflix. The adventure continues. Weird that it, it the the titles all say Saturday morning cartoon, and then they scratch out the Saturday morning, and then they put Stranger Thing, Stranger Cartoon, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And they look pretty like they're not going to show those on Saturday morning, are they? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think it's aimed at the same audience. That sort of probably tween teen plus kind of audience on on netflix yeah. Yeah. yeah stranger morning cartoons well that's what that's what they did with the it was sort of like star wars visions right they did that last year but this is i guess they're they're focusing on this a little more uh broadly for a a proper series on netflix again haven't announced the timing of this one whether it's going to come before the final season, after the final season, years after the final season. So again, I'm I'm I'll I'm not waiting with the lights on for this one, but it it's an interesting prospect. Again, I, I don't mind it when they cross into animation. It allows a lot more creativity because obviously you can really let your imagination loose and it doesn't cost you thirty million dollars to make, you know. You don't need to have a somebody spend sixteen hours in a prosthetic chair to make it happen. So it can be fun. And uh, they will wrap up my portion of the news with a couple of sad things because we lost two very important people this last week. Uh, Al Jaffe, one of the original, uh, uh, you know, he's, well, I, he's not, was not a staff staffer. He was one of the original artists who his work is synonymous with Mad Magazine. Uh, he died this week. I mean, week. he is actually Alfred E. Newman. You know. yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, Al Jaffe was, uh, he was 102, he died this week. Uh, he was a legend, an absolute legend for generations of of, uh, of kids. He was the inventor of the fold-in, the Mad Magazine fold-in, as somebody so eloquently put it on social media this last week. Thank you to the 
person who ensured that there is not a single copy of Mad Magazine in existence over a grade 3 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Because true. everybody folded that back cover. Yeah, I actually, I used to, it's funny, and when I got used to get them, I didn't fold them in. I would kind of like, I wanted to keep it, I don't know, I wasn't collecting comics, as you know. I Mad Magazine was, if you want to say, I, the comic book that I subscribed to, that would have been the one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I used to, I used to imagine, use my mind to sort of like imagine what the solution was without folding or I would curve it. I wouldn't actually bend it. Right. Yeah. That's, I got into that when I started buying it. I, at first I started reading mad magazines. I would buy them when I would go to use bookstores with my mom. And then later on, when I started buying it off the rack, I would do the same thing. I would gently fold it so I could see what it was, but not actually put a crease in it. But, yeah, and he was uh, an inventor of snappy answers to stupid questions. Yeah, yeah, I had and all uh, those fake uh, product ads. Yeah, yeah, I had all a whole pile. I still do have a huge pile of Al Jaffe's uh, when they did those paperback paperback yeah, books, the, book, yeah. the little yeah. the little dime store books. Mm -hmm. I have a huge pile of those with his Don Martin, Sergio Aragones, but yeah, Jaffe was always a favorite of mine. So, I mean, what an absolute freaking icon! Lived to a hundred and two, uh, you know, st still doing work. He has some hilarious obituary stuff this week. Apparently, people for years had been calling him and saying, "We want to do a fold in as part of this." you know, art project as part of a yearbook or whatever. And he's like, I don't own the thing. I just, I created it, but I don't own the rights to it. You go nuts. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Even Stephen Colbert on his show the other day, um, did a, like a, a you know, 10 minute talk about him at the end. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, uh, and, and it's funny, like he said, he, he got something, something about, you know, he was, he was glad to have ruined all of our lives. Right. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, in with his humor, right. Cause he was just so sarcastic and disrespectful i think i think he influenced a lot of people a lot absolutely. of young, young men absolutely. and women he's, yeah. he's right there in 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 my life influencing my sense of humor with you know mel brooks monty python just all these things yeah. that were formative in my sense of humor al jaffe was right there so uh he was an icon and a legend and he died an icon and a legend and uh his work will live on for a long time because he was just such a great, uh, such a great humorist. And, uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. sad to see him go. We also lost this week, uh, Rachel Pollock. So Rachel Pollock's not a name that everyone will know, but in the comics world, you certainly will. Um, Rachel was, uh, a comic book writer for a very long time, uh, credited with, uh, creating the first mainstream transgender superhero, Kate Godwin, when doing her run on the Doom Patrol series which inspired the Doom Patrol TV series, which is, has been on for the last few years. Um, Rachel was also extremely uh, of note because uh, she herself was trans and was one of the oh. earliest uh, people to have, uh, a, you know, complete surgery to become a woman when being, uh, you know, born as a man. And, you know, the fact that she, uh, you know, had this other career on top of, of, you know, the notoriety that came from that is, uh, is certainly of note as well. Her run, uh, on the doom patrol was in my mind, quite underrated. She, uh, I was a doom patrol fan back in the day. Uh, it was a very much sort of standard comic book. And then Grant Morrison took it over for a number of years and took it into this very weird space, which was definitely the, the original idea of going completely, dark and weird with it that that inspired that tv show but when he left the series i think a lot of people left with him thinking well that's the end of that era but she carried it on for a few more years afterwards and told some really interesting stories again creating kate and 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 really kind of continuing that weird magic-y kind of just odd view of superherodom and and that and um yeah just another another great uh, another great creator that we've unfortunately lost. Uh, she was 77 uh, and she died uh, of cancer this week after uh, a long battle. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. My, my story here is, is, is for the American fans of, of Picard. Um, the, apparently the two part finale will be shown in select IMAX theaters, none of which are in Canada. But one of which um, is in so Seattle, where? Washington. Everything Seattle, is Washington. on uh, join the wait list everywhere. <laughs> Los Angeles, New mean? York, Phoenix, San Francisco, Seattle, Orlando, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and Dallas. Mm -hmm. you, you can go to the website. Everything is on Join the Waitlist. So people people snatched up the tickets real fast. Wow. 
Oh, really? Huh. What does that mean? Like, the, you have to be on a wait list, or, or you're saying you're saying they're all sold out already? I, I, I don't even know if it was a sale thing. Was it? It says free tickets on the the tweet that's quoted in the article. Oh, free? so I get the impression okay. that it was like first come first serve, and then you oh. know if if people don't show up, it's like all right, next ten people in line, you get you're lucky, you get to come in. You know, maybe it's that kind of thing. Oh, I didn't think it was free. I mean, I would have paid to see this, but well. Especially the 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 near the end of this episode, right? Well, <laughs> that's it. Saw. Lobby mm-hmm. lobby your uh, local movie theater. Why are we getting this here? Once again, yeah. Canadians left out. Boo! The CRTC, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do get yeah. the we do get the healthcare. You got to take the good with the bad. That's true. That's true. We get the healthcare. We don't get the Star Trek. It's funny because one of my one of my friends at work, I, he's a Picard fan, and I, I told him today in our stand up and he's like so we're working in chicago next week <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think uh, did we talking about the ready room later or whatever but uh apparently they're putting the ready room on pause because of this yeah they didn't want spoilers leaking out about the stuff right yeah yeah for sure which rolls right into a main part of our show where we talk about something star trek related and this week we are of course talking about Season 3, Episode 9 of Star Trek Picard, Vox. Mm. And, uh, yeah. So we can we can dive in with our... Ele- I can give my, my elevator pitch, if you like. Yes, please do. Resisting a flyby is futile. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I mean, what'd you have? Um, I think I'll save some of the spoilerific ones till we get to the spoilers. So the mm. first two that I have are, are just more in the meme format. I have uh, what's in the Vox, what's in the Vox. <laughs> and, <laughs> and somehow Locutus returned. Somehow, yeah. Mm. <laughs> I had, uh, sometimes you really can't go home again, even if your counselor crashed that home on Viridian 3 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> True. It wasn't her fault. It was totally her uh, fault. No, I'm just, I was making a play on what's in the, what <laughs> yeah. Worf says later. Yeah. yeah. uh yeah so i mean this this one was uh this was a banger this was a banger of an episode like man this was uh this was like a christmas present for for longtime trek nerds Mm -hmm. yeah this the whole the whole subject matter exploit was was pretty cool i'm just i was trying to rack my brain so 30 years ago is it supposed to be taking place 35 years ago or is that when it actually took place like the, the, no, the next 35 generation years 30... in, in continuity is also how long ago okay that so the was we taken, didn't yeah. have the human genome i guess at that point i guess we didn't right we didn't have the dna code cracked at that point well apparently Let's we did think about that oh you mean Sorry? like we in the current like we as human no, beings in now, real life in, in real life, in real no, life no, you and you out and out you each other yeah yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah. because they made the implication that you know 300 years from now when when that there 30 years ago took place, you know, they didn't know how to, to determine whether DNA had been, you know, hacked or whatever. Yeah, I guess you that's know? the thing is they didn't look for it, right? That's that's how they basically tried to explain it, that they didn't look for it. Yeah, and it's an, it's an amazing sort of, like, should we call spoilers on this whole part of the show? What do you oh, think? Oh, yeah. I we mean, probably should. Okay. Here we go. Spoilers, so much in there. This is the spoiler part, folks. If, you're, if you're, you haven't watched the show and you don't want spoilers, Go listen to another podcast. <laughs> that should just and, be at the disclaimer at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so what I was going to say was, I think, I think, for, I don't know from what you think about from a writing point of view, but I think the way that the the virus, if you think you think about it, it's like, it's basically a DNA virus that has been planted in you know, and it's it's interesting that they were talking about this virus thing over. They've talked about the. The uh, the Dominion War virus that was used, and mm-hmm. and that should have been a clue to us because you mm-hmm. asked us a couple of day, couple of last week or the week before, what do we think the big bad is going to be? Mm-hmm. I mean, the Borg is obviously a, like a slam dunk, right? But you know, how do they solve this? Like they, you know, in First Contract, which is probably my favorite Star Star Trek movie, they have to go back in time. In fact, I actually actually ended up watching that whole episode last week when I was just or a couple of weeks ago when I was doing research for. The, the, the podcast i just sat and watched the whole thing from beginning to end but you know because in that one they they go back in time and they you know mm-hmm. they solve the problem of the borg um taking over the whole federation or the earth anyway right yep. or Saul as they call it in this in this show but 
Yeah, I think I don't know. I I thought it was really cool, cool writing, cool concept, and they kept it really well hidden, right? I don't, yep. I don't know. Did you did you see this coming, Jonathan? The DNA reencoding thing? No, no, that was well yeah. done. I uh, I tip my hat to them as far as a uh, how this all comes together stuff. I even I who are, are I'm quite adept at, at pulling out stuff. I I did have I wrote down. Well, you guys can see my notes. It's you know. The first couple of notes, and then when Jack starts talking, he's like, I, I feel like I'm seeking connection. And I was like, this all sounds very Borg. And then, like, three minutes <laughs> later on the show, I was like, oh, it's the Borg. Okay, well, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think for me, honestly, I felt like any connection to the Borg through this season, I kind of pretty much had disregarded because... We did the Borg the last two seasons. I honestly feel like that's the only thing about this that is kind of sitting a little strange. And we'll, I'll certainly get into that because that was my big question for this week. But I, I really feel like I was not looking for the Borg because I kind of felt like they did the Borg. They did the Borg in season one with the whole cube thing. They did the Borg in season two with the whole going back in time, the Borg queen, the new queen, the whole thing. I really felt like, well, it, it's not going to be Q and it's not going to be the Borg as the big bad because those are already off the table. They did Q last season. They did the Borg already. It's got to be something else to bring it all together. I, I guess I was looking past the obvious, right? Yeah, I mean, because especially when, you know, um, was it, what is the name of the woman that, um, oh, the Canadian girl plays that, that got, she got, because the queen took over, her, took her over in um, last, last season, right? Dr. Gerardi. Oh. Yeah, Alison Pill. Alison Pill, yeah. And I was trying to remember her name and the character, but... Yeah, Agnes Girardi, Girardi. right? Agnes. Yeah, yeah, I was trying to... Agnes, I had the name Agnes stuck. stuck. Yeah. But, um, yeah, because, I mean, that... Because, I mean, if they were coming to this plot point for this episode, obviously they didn't have this season written yet, I would think, because that kind of... Like you said, it doesn't make sense that they did the Borg in the first two seasons and then... Why wouldn't that Borg Queen know what, you know, you know, I know it's back in time and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but yeah, so it's, it's interesting and, and it's interesting that they, so I mean, theoretically the Borg, you know, having continued to collect technologies, you know, um, plant, have figured out how to plant themselves in, into Picard, you know, and, um, and come here too. Right. So. I did think that that was actually an elegant little bow on that piece too. Because we knew from the Star Trek movies, and we knew from mm -hmm. previous seasons of Picard that Picard could still hear the Collective. Yeah. And yeah. it always seemed really strange. Like, why could he still hear the Collective if he was no longer had his cybernetic implants, everything? So they looped that back in this episode by saying, that's this in being in my DNA, that's why I could hear them because they were transmitting and my body was picking up the signals. I thought that was really elegantly done to tie up a kind of a loose thread on why Picard could always hear the Borg in his head, even though he was no longer part of the collective. Mm -hmm. I, that was my big question for this episode was, so at one point, one of them uh, says, it's been 10 years since we encountered the Borg or since the Borg were last seen. But last season at the end, the beginning, the bookend of the season is that they encounter the Borg, right? They encounter Agnes as the Borg queen, and she's actually there to help them and whatever. Does, does Do people just not know that? Is that the idea that, like, they don't know that was a classified mission or something? Because there was a lot of Federation ships there, a lot of Starfleet ships in the, the, pilot, uh, the first episode of season two and the final episode of season two of Picard. That's, like, that was... Recently, right? That was within the last couple of years of this events of this series. Are, are you saying something on this show doesn't make sense? Well, I know it's radical. Like how about but... fireworks need oxygen to light <laughs> in space? <laughs> I wrote that. I wrote that down. You'll see it in my notes. It says fireworks in space with sound. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was. I, I listen. All the stuff we've been watching. Tim, you've been watching Star Trek for 50 years. I mean, I've been watching it for decades. The All the invention, the teleporter, the food replicator, none of that. Warp drives, fireworks that go off in the vacuum of space and also make sound. That is mm -hmm. magic. That is some know, serious yeah. science. Yeah. They're so space good. Space fireworks. Guys. Space they, fireworks. You guys forgot they're, they're space yeah. fireworks. <laughs> yeah, well, um, but I, I think Shaw... Uh, was 
you know, this whole season was kind of, uh, you know, besides Mr. Quips and, uh, you know, calling people out on their nonsense, he also was kind of the Mr. Exposition dump, right? And he did have an offhanded comment saying, like, uh, you know, besides all that crazy Borg stuff you guys did, you know, like, the, the real Borg are still out there, right? So he was, like... I think laying down the tracks that like, you know, he, you know, the, the happy fun time Jurati Borg, that faction, sure. Maybe they're okay ish and he's, you know, not going to give them, uh, you know, space in his house. Uh, but he's not going to be against them either. Mm. Whereas he says, Oh, the real Borg are out there. And maybe that was the hint that, Oh yeah, there, there is this other faction that's still out there. That's more traditional Borg. Yeah. I think that's how they're, they're trying to tie it together, but it's, you know, it's such a fast quip and he doesn't really spend a lot of time on it that uh, it makes yeah. it easy to, to miss it. I think when we're watching week to week versus well, like this episode down was jam too, right? Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's easy for a throwaway line like that to when you're getting all the exposition they dumped on us this week, plus the action. Yeah. I, yeah. I do wonder though, you were just saying, how do they undo this? I wonder if it does come back to the Girardi Borg versus the real Borg kind of thing next week. Oh, that, that's maybe. something mm. that popped into my head was, well, they made friends. They made nicey nice with, with some Borg. Maybe it's a Borg well, on Borg. Did she return to the present timeline? Did, did Q zap her forward too? No, because remember, she leaves Earth in the past and mm. then reappears to them in the future when... They need saving from the anomaly. Oh, when they go back to the yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. So she's in their timeline. The yeah. So it's possible. It's certainly possible. Yeah. This was um, yeah. This episode definitely had pew 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 all over it. The the scene with the the fleet takeover was some pretty impressive pew pew pew. Where all of a sudden everybody started turning into zombies before everyone's eyes, and then, and there's gunfights and there's space fights. There was basically a uh, Firing squad on the USS Excelsior. Yeah. That was grim. We've retaken the bridge. Wait a minute. They're all lining up in front of us. And of course it's the Excelsior, right? That gets that gets taken out. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty bonkers. People uh, started asking if Elnor was still on the Excelsior because he was yeah, stated yeah. last season to be posted there. So yeah. uh, in, in the grand rule of if you don't see a body, they're not dead. Uh, yeah. Just assume that he was like on a shuttle somewhere. Or, or and, transferred by then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, true, yeah. Any other pew pew pews? Yeah, no, I think it was pew pew pew. All, well, the fireworks, obviously, but the... <laughs> the um, I thought it was cool. I don't know if Jaime might get this joke, too, but I was I was just watching it a little bit. I was watching it again just before we started recording, and uh, they, they have the, the new Apple CarPlay going on the big screen. You know, the part where Jordy <laughs> yeah. brings up all the diagram with the big... You know how they have mm-hmm. the CarPlay that extends across multiple screens, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So they have that on the on the new Enterprise, <laughs> or that was it's not Enterprise. So what's the name of the ship? Titan, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's Titan. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was kind of cool. Uh, if we can get into Easter eggs for a second too, the the uh, one Easter egg for me was I was wondering whether it was Annie Wershing's voice, but it turned out to be Alice Krieg, who I, I'm putting down as a yep as right. an Easter egg, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mm-hmm. had that in my notes uh, that there was uh, no mistake in my mind as soon as I heard her voice that that was Alice Krieg. Yeah, just the way she inflects. Yeah. She, I mean, she's yeah. South African. You can really tell in her voice, but yeah, right. that to me, as soon as she said it, it, it made sense. And of course, Annie, uh, I don't know if she was, uh, well enough, yeah, well enough so given that she passed yeah. away shortly after season two. So, uh, yeah, it's hard to say the, the uh, Easter eggs abounded here. Obviously the, uh, the return of the big D, the, the fat yeah. one, uh, yep. is it just me or do, does, uh, do you not realize until this series that there were so many penile euphemisms for the enterprise the big d the fat one uh maybe maybe that's uh just me but yeah, it's just just you yeah like, <laughs> i i had that as one of my spoilerific uh elevator pitches of like jordy whips out the d you know <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you jaime thank you <laughs> uh but that was also uh, the one that really stuck out to me was we, we saw Admiral Elizabeth Shelby. Um, for those of you racking your memory banks, thinking, I know that face. Why do I know that face? Of course, she was the, the one who came in uh, in the Best of Both Worlds episode, the, the, the first sort of major showdown with the Borg, where Locutus and the whole thing. And she was the uh, she was brought in as like a specialist. And then once 
Riker got promoted to acting captain. She became the acting first officer to the Enterprise D right. back mm-hmm. then. And of course, she was in those episodes. Here we see her pop up. And of course, Riker makes some crack about her. Uh, but then like five minutes later, we get to see her get shot to death, which is I it's. I felt a little bit, you know, like I felt I've been feeling awkward since this, since the episode, a few episodes back where they brought back Michelle Forbes as Roe Laren, because I yeah. love that character. I thought she was great. I think she's a terrific actor. And the fact that they brought her back for like, not even a full episode and killed her off again. I was like, that's kind of a bummer. But this was worse where they're like, hey, you know her? Remember her from that episode? Hey, she just took two in the chest. She's dead. Like, whoa, that's harsh. Yeah. Speaking of Michelle Forbes, I just watched an episode of the next generation uh the one where um this crazy admiral woman comes and and tries to, to oh yeah ends yeah. up putting picard on trial yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah right um michelle forbes was in that episode as as a as an alien character oh hmm. Hmm. i remember that yeah. okay yeah i, I remember, remember that was the very much the uh, mccarthy episode right where they're like name names there's a conspiracy you're all in on it yeah and they and they yeah the the young doctor they um, because he's actually not Vulcan, he's actually Romulan. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. And he, he hid that on his application. And, yeah. yeah, they're just looking for... It's the old, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail kind of thing. Yeah, well, yeah, it's McCarthyism in action, right? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Uh, quotes, man, this was just another jam-packed full of great quotes. Yeah, I love da- Data's quotes, the best one, but I'll let you I'll let you spill that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, so we'll start at the top. Which he had was... a couple, actually. He, had, he almost was like a bit like Sheldon today. Like, he almost yeah. offered to make Picard a hot beverage, right? Well, it's funny because Worf had been the one who's just been crushing all season long, right? Just these one-liners that are just hilarious and devastating. And yeah, Data seems to have supplanted the, uh, the, the Worfisms, but... Uh, yeah, you know, Troy very seriously at the beginning, forgive me, but as of this moment, your son is dangerous. That was great, like, menacing yeah, opening episode. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when Picard, of course, finds out that uh, he slash Locutus is the father of Jack and talking to Beverly, he says, he inherited the best of you and the worst of me. That that was really mm-hmm, quite mm-hmm. grim and interesting. And, of course, Patrick Stewart's such a wonderful actor. He and she line. says, I gave Wesley space and, you know, I lost him to it, which yeah. is pretty much what you said last week <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. yep uh jordy talking about him he may be borg but he's that's not all he is i thought that was a nice mm-hmm. again it's, it's funny that the personalities when you read these quotes you you really feel like you they are something those characters would say right like that's that's how jordy would spin that that's how picard would spin that that's how troy would you know like it just it's it's a beautiful thing to see these people so familiar in their roles and good writing uh They've been assimilating the entire fleet this whole time without anyone ever knowing it. That is just one of those killer, like, dun-dun-dun lines. Uh, <laughs> when when all of them step off the turbo lift, I've never been so happy to see so many wrinkles from Troy. I, I thought this was interesting that the solution was anti-ageism here. Right? Oh, like, <laughs> I think I think we, we need to, di- to, to dive into that one, particularly you, Tim, who's experienced a little ageism in your life. Did you not feel like this was the whole crew basically thumbing their nose at the at the Hollywood acting industry? Maybe, maybe, yeah, that could be. Like the the solution to the the problem is to not be young. Right? Yeah, like oh, you think you're so good casting all these young hot people? Well, look at us. We're the ones who come to the rescue. Yeah, <laughs> this is Revenge of the Boomers. That's what they should have called. Yeah, let me hang on. I gotta get my walker ready. And... <laughs> Uh, but you're right. Data had the data had the best delivery in this one. When Jordy's like, you know, could you look on the bright side? And he says, I hope we die quickly. <laughs> With a big smile on his face too. Brent Spiner's uh, a fun actor. I'm glad they let him. Uh, a, they brought him back, obviously. But I love that they're just sort of letting him loose a little bit because he is a, a genuinely funny performer. And we even oh, the got other Easter egg is the, is the computer voice. Right? I was just going to say, Majel Barrett. We got to hear Majel Barrett do her her voice uh, and demote the captain, demote the admiral to the captain, which was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Command transfer to Captain John Luke Picard. Well, I guess I'll take the field transfer. Yeah, yeah. What uh, I mean, did you see it coming when they started when Jordy took them back to the fleet museum? Did you think it was going to be the D? Well, we got it. We got to give a shout out to one of our fans here. Um, because uh, Jaime and I have been having a back and forth with him on, on our Slack channel. Mm. And that's an invitation to other people listening to the show. Come and join the Slack channel where we, you know, we interact with you. Mm-hmm. Um, hang on, friends of the show. Was it Dave that was talking about Enterprise D, Jaime? 
I think so, because I think he had asked the question of uh, what was it that was in that hangar we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, because like, he, he says the one thing I, sh- I felt they should have should have had was Enterprise D, and, and I said, what the, that one? Nobody likes that one. And then, um, yeah, so so shout out to him, because, I mean, like, obviously they kept this, they kept this one as a surprise, right? Uh, it was almost like um, it reminds me of all those shows I watch on the History Channel where they, you know, they they retro, you know, Rick and those guys and and the you know, Ace of Cars or whatever they call that guy, um, uh, Rust Valley Restoration, where they where they get old things and put them together and they get they borrow the nacelles from another ship and mm-hmm. you know they they uh, they get the they drag the thing back from Viridian Four and. and uh, Jordy goes in there with his hammer and just straightens all the metal out, and <laughs> it did look like a like a, it looked like something somebody had just sort of cobbled together too, right? Like it wasn't like you know put together by the the and he, I think he said he had drones putting it together or something at one point, right? He had he mentioned uh, having robots or uh, and, oh and, yeah, because he, 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 he said they were loading the torpedoes, right? He said I we I forgot have, uh, we forgot when Seven says the robot was correct when she's referring to data. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> which, which you know, hey, pot, maybe kettle, no, stop. Yeah, <laughs> like, well, yeah, she's human though, right? Yeah. So is he. He's he's a, a human now. He's he's human in a human basically body, just like Picard does. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing. Like, because there's two things that I thought about the Borg. Right? Is how does the Borg assimilate the the changelings, and how do they? How could they assimilate data? I mean, they tried to with the with the because that was the one plot point in first contact right. is they couldn't assimilate him but they could give him skin well that's it they were trying to find another way to entice him which he jokes in the movie at the end he basically says you know nice try it yeah i, I thought about it for a long time like point zero 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 one of a second i thought about it right yeah 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 but yeah i mean i don't i don't get the impression that they assimilated the changelings i think the idea is that the chain link changelings willingly work with them because no they are i said, this I mean, breakaway like, faction, like right there isn't a mechanism for them to assimilate the, the changelings because they would have to change. Well, I mean, I supposedly Picard changed the changelings by introducing that virus that killed all of them, half of them off, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but and then you know, what's her name did all the experiments on them? But because I mean, that's the one thing about the the Borg. Well, the Borg does take your technology and make it part of their own. That's the whole, you know, because that's what, what's their line? Resistance is futile. We're going to take the best. I, I figure I'm misquoting it, but they basically say, we'll take the best of your technology and assimilate it into ours, right? Yeah. 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 So they can't, they can't really bring the, the changeling thing in, but it's interesting how the, the, um, the takeover of the Federation isn't the changeling. That's the part that everybody missed, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of a, a, an interesting pairing beyond just the superficial, like these were some of the big bads, right? It was mm-hmm. the, the Borg is the big bad for the TNG crew and, and, and the, the Voyager crew later on and the changelings um, in the form of the Dominion being the big bad for the DS9 crew. Mm-hmm. There's something to be said about the fact that the changelings and the Borg both enjoy the unity, right? So they have that shared oh, the common one voice, ground. Yeah. Just the Borg view it as we will force it upon you. And the changelings view it as I desire to be an individual sometimes. And sometimes I feel like I need to connect. So it's kind of the big difference there. So it's not, even though they don't cover that at all so far in what we've seen, it kind of makes sense to me that they might be able to, to work together against their common enemy, given that they do have some common ground and how they philosophically view things. Yeah. Yeah. And that sort of fleet, t- what do they call the fleet takeover thing, where it, that was pretty much like, and somebody, I think Picard calls it out, that they're they're being really Borg-like by having one, you know, all the ships get taken over at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What they got they the uh, cloud sync thing, so they can yeah. do the fleet formation and stuff. Yeah. 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 iCloud it up, and yeah. Yeah. I put... Apple's um, everywhere. You can't get rid of Apple, you know? <laughs> <laughs> For my, uh, one of my other spoilerific uh, elevator pitches was Gen Z will be the end of us all because they had that hard <laughs> cutoff line at 25, uh, 25 and younger. Um, the uh, the Easter egg that, that didn't get mentioned in the fleet, which people are, you know, taking their, their high quality screenshots mm-hmm. and, and posting full rosters. But I heard the USS Pulaski, like uh, nice. Dr. Pulaski, I heard that one mentioned. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, apparently in my notes here for some of my big questions, I'll give a quick rundown here. I put about uh, 
you know, is assimilation now an STD? You know, that's like new form <laughs> using, <laughs> using Picard's uh, DNA that's now in all, all the, the kiddos. Um, yeah, I wrote this note that will make a little bit more sense when we get to our pick of the weeks. But uh, uh, I wrote that, uh, you know, they had misdiagnosed Picard with erotic syndrome. And it turns out he has erotic syndrome and a desire for <laughs> sexy cakes. <laughs> And the analogy that I didn't think I would be making, but I kind of wonder how intentional it is, is, you know, is Jack Crusher's killer mode? Because we didn't know what it was before, right? It was Mm. like, oh, how did he like become suddenly like super good and like John Wick the heck out of people? And now we see, like, oh, it's because he's got the connection to the Borg and it kind of makes sense that he might be able to tap into something other than himself. So my question Mm. here is, is Jack's killer mode kind of analogous to Rutherford's killer mode shown in the lower decks mm. where Rutherford was like being puppeteered by his implant into being this incredible security guard, just beating the heck out of Borg. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just a, a common theme that they went with, but it seemed interesting to have that in modern Trek. Yeah. Well, it is a trope actually. I was going to say like right from the very beginning, like you, said john i think uh, almost like the first broadcast episode of um star trek the original series was a um an episode where people get taken over right in fact even the the cage um not the the original um pilot uh was a human being taken over by another another species and becoming a super super human you know with sally kellerman and and Mm -hmm. um uh what's his name played uh gary lockhart yeah um those two like so that kind of that kind of the idea of you know and kirk i think kirk in one of the first broadcast episodes he switches with his his um lady friend who's jealous of the fact that men get all the good roles in star trek she takes over his body and does a body switch with him right and one last thing just before we wrap up this one is the fact check on um, michelle forbes was it was actually the episode where Charles Ogden Steiger meets Majel Barrett, and who's playing Luxana Troy, mm. and she finds out that he he's got this one last scientific mission which fails, and but but then he has to because he's turning sixty, he has to go and yeah. take his own life because that's how his culture works. She plays his daughter, huh. Michelle Forbes. Yeah, huh. she's like, "Why are you doing this? This is the way. This is what you wanted, you know." And he says, "This is the way." This is the way. Yes. <laughs> the uh, the best pew 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 I went with. I went with something non traditional because I figured you guys would get the uh, the many pew pew pews that happened throughout this episode. Um, I went with the and it looks like you have a link here, so we were of common minds. I went with the off screen pew 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 that's hinted at with the loss of the Enterprise E, presumably under Worf's command, so lost that they you know they they couldn't pick up all the pieces and put it back together again. Like they did the D. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you're right. I, I put this link in here saying whatever happened to the Enterprise D. I, cause I, I had no contact, contact and I Googled it and it turns out that nobody knows what happened to the Enterprise D. Worf did become the captain of the Enterprise D for a short time, uh, but then he went somewhere else. And then, but it was, which is why he's saying it wasn't really my fault because nobody knows in, in canon what happened to the Enterprise D. Oh, the E, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, the E. The, the sovereign class e. E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I thought that's for a second that's what, that's what, uh... Troy? No, no, no. I thought that's what, uh, Shelby was, was in. I thought that was the, like, flagship that she was broadcasting from when they first popped up. Oh, I okay. thought that that's what that was supposed to be, but then I realized that was something else. Yeah. Was that the big ship that came out of, and the, the ship coming out of the Starbase was sort of, um, like a, a preview to what you know, when Jordy does his big yeah. reveal, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a foreshadow for sure. Yeah, because they didn't, they didn't name the ship. I was trying to watch, because I saw that scene again, but they didn't really sort of name what the name of the ship that she was on, did no. they? No. I thought they said that she was on the Enterprise F that was, like, cleared to, to leave the space dock. Oh, was that the F? Oh. I thought that was the Enterprise oh. F. The uh... After 30 years, you think they'd only got to the letter F? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, about a generation and a half. That sounds about right. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, we missed our big segue over to Mandalorian when you said this is the way. Yes. Well, but now this is the way that we go to the Mandalorian. Oh, this Welcome is the back way. Welcome back to those of you who skip. 
A client met his banker to discuss opening a restaurant in a busy airport. In us, he found a partner that understood the importance of reaching for the sky. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. Well, welcome back to the uh, the, man, the show. If you've skipped the skipped ahead past the, the spoilers, <laughs> um, Mandalorian season three, episode seven, chapter twenty three, the spy. Still a confusing title, but um, yeah, yeah, interesting episode. Return of the bad, big bad. So, you guys got some pitches for us? Mine was straightforward. It was uh, Bo Katan brings the tribes together to retake Mandalore. Yeah. Mm. And mine piggybacks nicely off that. It was the Mandalorian factions are finally united, but are they too little and too late? Mm. Mm-hmm. So again, this was uh, the, the penultimate episode of this season, and it was very much sort of bringing together all these disparate pieces that we've been watching all season. Some of it was pretty obvious. Again, they were talking, you know, foreshadowing some of this stuff. We had seen um, uh, Elia Kane, the, the secret Imperial agent who we knew that worked for Moff Gideon, the one who, you know, wiped Dr. Pershing's mind a few episodes back. So we start the episode with her, right? And she's on Coruscant. Mm-hmm. And then we see, of course, Moff Gideon. And Gideon is like, that's it. We got to wipe these Mandalorians out. And then and then we see Gideon wander into this Shadow Council, which is was a really interesting one because we saw some familiar faces in there. So that's I had that tied into my Easter egg. We we got to see uh Commandant Brendel Hux, the father yeah. of uh of the uh Imperial of Hux. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, it was with the uh First Order, right? The leader of the First Order in uh in the sequel trilogy. And Actually played by Brian Gleason, brother of Domino, who played Hux. Which oh no, I thought yeah, they just, the voice did sound the same. I was, I was confused by that at first. But yeah, yeah, I thought cool. I, I thought for a second maybe it was the same actor, but no, it was his brother. Yeah, I got the impression and, it was a family member when I heard yeah. Hux. Yeah, and uh, we also saw Captain Pelion in there. So Pelion was the sort of leader of ostensibly the Shadow Council. He's the one who's talking about the re- reemergence of Grand Admiral Thrawn. He's mm-hmm. a character from Rebels who is basically Thrawn's number two guy on on his lead flagship during the, the Rebel series. So that's the first time we've seen that in live action. And so, again, a very strong connection to the inevitable. And obviously, we've seen it now in the trailer for Ahsoka. And they've talked about it multiple times in this series, Return of, of Grand Admiral Thrawn, who, of course, his return is heavily foreshadowed as we've been going through this. But... Moff Gideon is basically to the point where he's like, you know, you keep saying Thrawn's coming back, but I don't see Thrawn around. So clearly not everybody is on Team Thrawn at this point. So interesting that there's still a bit of a schism there, right? Um, By the way, did you, did you know the, the character Katie, o, Katie M. O'Brien, who plays the, the character who, um, at the beginning, meets with Moff Gideon? Yeah. I think she plays the... Yeah, she's the main character with that character in um in the Quantumanium realm. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Know, the, yeah. So she's a a stunt performer. She'd been a stunt performer for her, uh, a large portion of her career and has just sort of shifted uh, okay. over to acting over the last few years, but you can tell obviously from her physique she's a very um uh yeah. you know, athletic woman and I think uh yeah, she she just sort of fit what they were looking for in that character and I can't say I'm blown away by her acting, but her physicality is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so and so we get this sort of looming sort of uh, this is all going to go bad. I'm coming, Gideon's back, and he's coming for the Mandalorians. And of course, we go then we go back to uh, the Mandalorians. They they're all getting back together. <laughs> Grogu gets. Um, to walk around in the cadaver of IG-88 or IG-11 yeah. as IG-12. That was weird and creepy. Yeah, but funny. But it was, I mean, it was super funny. The, you know, I have that, I had that in my quotes. We'll get, we'll get around to that. But, uh, yeah. and, of, and of course they, they get the whole gang. They load up the ships and they head to Mandalore. They find these survivors. They're looking for the Great Forge. And uh, in in amidst the search for the Great Forge, they end up underground after this monster, you know, destroys the survivor's ship. And then, bang, they're face-to-face with Gideon and this huge Imperial base where they've clearly been mining Beskar. And uh, all hell breaks loose, and it really just sort of comes to a head. Yeah. The new Dark dark Troopers with, with uh, Beskar, Beskar um, armor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it 
it uh, it does not go well for the Mandalorians in that moment. But we do know that uh, Axe Wolves escapes, right? He He's the one who goes for help. And we know that the armorer is already headed back to the ship, although that's kind of left in a gray area, too, because she's signaling the ship. We never hear back from that. So it's, I don't know if we're supposed to infer that the ship's been taken over or where we're at or they're jamming her signal. I don't know. We'll figure that out next week. But and um, yeah, and then, you know, uh, we 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 see the demise of one of the, the longer standing characters from the Mandalorian, uh, Paz Vizsla, uh, the the heavy, large, armored troop who has the the giant uh repeating blaster basically holds off the the dark troopers while everyone else can escape and uh ends up coming doing pretty well for himself all things being equal basically kills all the dark troopers and then of course the the three praetorian guards from from uh the last jedi show up and (laughs) it doesn't go as well for him and he's dead within 30 seconds his minigun overheats right so he yeah. he has to go hand to hand so he ends up getting my uh my best pew 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 with a Paz Vizsla ain't got time to bleed kind of yeah. thing like Jesse yeah. the body of Antera from Predator <laughs> if folks didn't uh, didn't see that you're uh, bleeding yeah. he's the same dude basically the same dude <laughs> just put a helmet on him and there you go that's that's Paz Vizsla um yeah same voice too yeah, yeah. Well, the voice is uh is actually John Favreau with uh doing Paz Vizsla's voice which is pretty funny oh is it really oh, yeah because cool. he actually did um he did Paz Vizsla's ancestor on the Clone Wars show uh who ah. was a character there and then he so yeah that they I guess they just carried it forward but yeah it's pretty funny um, My pew 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 is I love it when when they take the the lightsaber and carve through the big steel doors, right? Yeah, that's always yeah, good. That's my <laughs> favorite scene from that's a, when when uh, uh, Don did that in, um, in oh, Phantom Menace. Menace. That yeah. was pretty cool too. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, hold them off while I cut a hole in the door. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it was nice that this episode was actually moving a bit forward. Last week was a real struggle for me. I, I, I mean, we talked about it. I, it, it was, so, yeah, it was really bad, really yeah. bad. Like it was, it, it wasn't like, a, a, a jumping the shark, but boy, uh, I could see the shark from here. It was not good. And to come back with a, with a banger like this with, you know, it still had all those hallmarks of, of the series, you know, the, the chemistry, the characters and stuff like that. Although I was listening to a pod earlier this week where they made the really good point. The thing that's kind of been off this season is that there hasn't been a lot. There's been such an ensemble. There hasn't been enough Din and Grogu, Din and Grogu doing Din and Grogu stuff. Mm-hmm, you know, in mm-hmm. this time, they, you know, <laughs> and maybe the worst dad of the year award. He's like, OK, we're all going into battle. Keep up. <laughs> like, yeah. maybe let him stay there. Maybe put him at the back. Like, don't bring. Yeah, where was where baby. was he in the trap? Right. Where yeah. was he in the trap? And because and it. They don't show him escaping either, right? Yeah, no, he he does escape with the rest of the gang at the end. You see him duck through the door, or the hole that that okay. Bo-Katan yeah. cuts. But yeah, it's um, it's not it's not good parenting to to bring your baby into battle. I think, but uh, no. yeah, no. yeah. The big question I had for this one was why of all those characters does Gideon want Din? Why, why capture Din? Why, why him of all those characters? What is special about Din? That's, I'm not sure. Maybe the... he's got a gun back in his room and they're going to, you know, we can just kill him now. Like, we can gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can be a bonding moment. Yeah. Any theories, Jaime? No clue. Not much, except for the connection to Grogu. Like, if they couldn't capture Grogu, they can use Din Djarin as his father to mm, bait him. Bait. Yeah. 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 Mm. Lure the the force sensitive child there to try to make the, um, the, the perfect mix that's mentioned here. So Gideon mentions, you know, this perfect mix of cloner Jedi and Mandalorian that, uh, you know, would still make sense to get, uh, Grogu involved mm. with, mm. you know, getting the midi chlorians and etc. It's pretty funny though. Cause the way that they sprung the trap, you'd think they would have been just like, Hey, wait till the little green guy is near the front. You know what I mean? Like it, it just it, <laughs> yeah. it seemed a little as meticulously planned as it was, and as as well as it went for the for the imperial slash first order. It, you'd think if that was the goal, they probably could have made that happen. 
But then who brings a baby to a Mandalorian fight, like you said, right? But if that the like whole, maybe they weren't expecting that. That's right? the thing. I think that's true. I think but then if you if you're in that moment and your long term goal is get the little green guy so you can get his blood, if you spot him there, wouldn't you be like, Okay, plan changed, goal number one is bring me that little green dude. Yeah. And why didn't he force push them all off the platform? Yes. Well, I think he was too busy using his hands to steer IG twelve. Yeah, and, pre- and press the no button during battles. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, he he, he had my uh, my quotes, which were no, 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 and yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. Grogu, yeah. Grogu in his mecca is how I wrote that one down. <laughs> yeah, I, I had that in my quotes as well. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. Um, but there were some other good ones in there. The uh, the menacing line at the beginning when we see the Shadow Council where Captain Pelion says, Grand Admiral Thrawn's return will herald in the re-emergence of our military and provide Commandant Hux enough time to deliver on Project Necromancer. Gee, I wonder what that's alluding to. Mm-hmm. Um, another uh, Enzelin, when the Enzelin delivers IG-12, bad baby, no squeezy. That's, again, yeah. those guys <laughs> win the best quote every time. Uh, Mandalore has always been too powerful for an enemy to defeat. It is always our own division that destroys us, Bo-Katan. I thought that was good, especially, and again, if, you've, uh, if you're a fan of all of, especially the, the Filoni version of the, of the Star Wars verse, the, the Clone Wars, Rebels, you've seen it. You've seen it firsthand. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. But I mm-hmm. think the, uh, the most deliciously delivered uh, Giancarlo Esposito doing his best... Uh, You were a talented people, but your time has passed. However, as you can see, Mandalore will live on in me. Thank you for your planet's rich resources. I have created the next generation dark trooper suit forged from Beskar alloy. And the most important improve or most impressive improvement is that it has me in it. Oh my God. That's awesome. (laughs) What a line. The most impressive improvement is it has me in it. Oh my God. I'm not sure how he fits that ego inside that mine shaft. So next week, we've already had a major character death. Well, major character, I guess a decent supporting character, a known quantity in Paz Vizsla. Uh, I did have a bad feeling because they were really doing a lot of uh, a Bo-Katan uplifting, bringing the tribes together, the worried leader, all that stuff through this episode. I was worried they were foreshadowing her going. And I'm like, man, if they kill Bo-Katan, we, we riot. Like, I, she, I love that character. <laughs> She's one of my very favorite Star Wars characters, and I would have been really ticked off if they killed her off at this point. Well, who's going to carry the dark saber? <sighs> I mean, Grogu. I really don't even know at this point. Uh, I'll be curious to see how they how they land this one for next week. You know, obviously the series isn't over; it's still going to be going, so they're not going to land it in a permanent way. I don't think we're killing off any major characters again next week. But I really do wonder where they're going to leave things off if we know this is the final episode of this season. And and this is where we're going to be sitting with this for for a while. I mean, we are going to be in the same timeline when Ahsoka comes in August. So there's a chance, obviously, just like there was with Book of Boba Fett, for those ramifications to uh, con- continue. But I wonder if we're going to see uh, a satisfying resolution or if we're going to be a little more like Bad Batch and we're going to see something that ends on, on more of a a cliffhanger you don't know what's going to happen next kind of thing wait isn't luke going to come back next week and save them who knows maybe he's got a bunch of younglings he can throw into the fray hmm. we'll have to wait and see all right let's move on to our watch list yeah i've got a, a couple things so this weekend we are getting the uh, beginning of the fourth and final season of barry i mentioned it, uh, a few weeks ago that this is uh, a series i really enjoy bill Hader. uh has apparently gone full auteur for the fourth season. He's uh, he's doing a lot of the uh, the writing and directing himself, as well as starring in it. Hmm. I don't know if you guys are up on Barry, but uh, this third season ended on a bit of a holy smokes moment, and uh, and this one sort of picks up after that. So I'll be really curious to see how they land it. This is the fourth and final season. I'll be curious to see if they can stick the landing on what has been a really really interesting series. It's at times laugh out loud funny. It is times heartbreaking. It's a it's a really interesting ride, and I'm I'm curious to see how they're gonna how they're gonna land that one. Yeah, that's another one I have to go and catch up on. That's on HBO right here. Uh, yeah, it's on Crave. Or not yeah. HBO or, or Crave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, if you're not if you're not watching it, if you're not caught up, do do make the effort. Uh, I just rewatched because I had it been quite a while since I watched season three, so I rewatched season three recently, so I could have it fresh in my mind, and uh, was just reminded of so many great performances. Uh, you know, Henry Winkler and Bill Hader and 
uh, yeah, just across the board. Really, really great show. The other thing I finally got to this week, after a very long wait, I finally watched Matrix Resurrections. Yeah. Uh, I have owned this for quite a long time. I think I got it for Father's Day uh, on uh, 4K Blu-ray last year. But uh, my son and I have been sort of waiting, and we were going to watch it, and then we weren't. Then we wanted to watch other things, and we were catching up with stuff. And anyways, long story short, we finally sat down and watched it this week. Uh, not, not a, not a perfect movie. It certainly, you know, it was, it had its moments. I can't say I loved it, but I did enjoy it. And I could see it was almost like a bit of a redemption arc for how the Matrix trilogy ended. Yeah. The way that they were trying to sort of give it a more of a happier, upbeat ending than, than where we left off. Uh, yeah, it was okay. It was okay. I mean, you consider the the plot point of the of the third movie, I guess, or second or third movie. I can't forget where the architect was in the second, story, but second, yeah, yeah. The whole it just loop just repeats over and over again. I mean, like mm. that to me, that was such a disappointing um, plot point, right? Because um, then it never ends, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, I, I think I think that I like the way they played with a few things here, like the the uh, going to the psychiatrist and and him messing with him messing with uh, with neo mm -hmm. especially with the pills right and yeah. then and also the the at the very beginning when they're first revealing the story about it, how this neo guy has actually written a game called the matrix mm. right you know which is kind of kind of fun oh that whole that whole you know movie we all loved 20 years ago was just a game <laughs> yeah you know that was kind of an interesting twist and and they could have really gone you know kind of far with that but you know they they pull them back in again you know yeah. so yeah it was very, yeah, the whole movie was a little too wink and a nod for, for my taste. It, it, that's, I think, where they kind of lost me a little bit. It, it, it didn't feel quite as earnest. But then that being said, I think parts two and part three were so wildly over earnest that I think that was the problem with them. They were taking it all so seriously and like, no, it's, it's, it's no, no, it's just not. But, uh, but no, I think it was, uh, I, I think as far as sequels 20 years later go, it was, uh, it was, you know, perfectly satisfactory experience. It just, it didn't knock my socks off and it certainly didn't give me that moment. Like when I watched the original matrix and went, whoa, that is something else. Well, this is the thing I, I watched an interview or listened to an interview with Keanu Reeves on smart lists. Right. And he was talking about, they were, cause they were talking about his whole career and yeah, the, the whole matrix thing. I mean, he described that as a perfect movie. It was just a great script, and, mm -hmm. and he couldn't imagine what it would look like. And then when he got it in the theater, it was like really cool. I I've been a huge fan of that, and, I'm, and I've always been disappointed with the with the two that came afterwards. Right, so I find this one this one's much more enjoyable. This is probably my second favorite Matrix movie. Mm. You know, yeah, it's funny though because I think I was thinking about two and three, two in particular. I think is salvaged somewhat by the the action set piece on the highway is spectacular it's one of the better real mixed with cgi action stunt scenes of the last 20 years so no matter how bad that movie is that like 20 minute stretch is unbelievable so good you know uh carrie ann moss and black leather riding the ducati backwards down the highway i mean come on but um but three, there's not a lot to hold on to. This one, yeah, I could see why. I, like, it's it's just a like I say, it's ta not taking itself quite as seriously, which I think maybe helped. The meta conversation about we're we're gonna do this thing with your uh, your baby, your intellectual property that's now our intellectual property, and you can be along for the ride or you cannot was uh, kind of interesting given the out of the universe stuff that happened that even made this sequel come to life, right? The like Warner Brothers was going to do this movie whether Wachowski was involved or not. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Did not know that. What you got first, Jaime? I spoiled it earlier with the uh, erotic syndrome thing, so if you haven't seen the Sexy Cakes skit starring Patrick Stewart and Rob Schneider from that era of Saturday Night Live, I, I highly recommend check it out. <laughs> the, it's a good one, because... Uh, it was um, quite a, a change of pace for uh, Patrick Stewart to do that sort of role, right? He was, uh, you know, Mr. Captain Picard, you know, Shakespearean actor, etc. He uh, he hadn't 
quite done some of the other uh, funny stuff, like his uh, his portrayal in uh, Frasier, etc. So I do remember yeah. seeing this uh, seeing this live, and uh, it came to mind when I made the Eromotic Syndrome connection. Yeah, he's an he's an underratedly funny actor. He's his sense of humor is so, as you say, he's he's taken so seriously, even in playing a Star Trek character. He brought such gravitas to it. But you see things like this, and you see things like uh, his performances of voice actor on like American Dad and on Family Guy, and then you, uh, one of my favorite uh, shows was a BBC show called Extras, um, Ricky Gervais, and he, each episode had these like he was supposed to be he was supposed to be an extra on all these movies and shows and stuff like that, and so they would have these guest stars, Patrick Stewart's in one of them, and he's so funny. But yeah, it's it's true. You don't think of him as a, a comedic actor because he is, you know, Jean Luc Picard, and he is reading, you know, Charles Dickens, and he's reading Shakespeare, and and yeah, when you see him be funny, you realize like, damn, this guy's really good. He's really funny. Yeah, that's great. Good pull, I mean. Cool. I see him a lot of a lot of shows on the Graham Norton show because a lot of times he's on with um, Ian um, McKellen. Yeah, 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 McKellen. Yeah, they're 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 a pretty funny couple, and they've actually been. They've been in a lot of uh, shows together, mm -hmm. like over the years, right? So it's kind of kind of interesting to see that. Well, I guess that's it for another week. So, hey, Jonathan, if people want to get in touch with you, where would they find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as at JPK News or on YouTube at youtube.com slash at JPK. Hey, okay, cool. And hi, Maeve, if people want to find you? I'm on Twitter as at Dev of the Hair. All right. My name is Timitra, T I M M I T R A, on the Twitter machine is where you'll find me. Until next time, we'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast Podcast. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. Yesterday we had a big, uh, big problem at work because um, half of our, you know, company is fans of the Chicago Bulls, and the other half, oh, yeah. of the company is fans of the Toronto Raptors. Yep. Did you see that? That what's his name? Demond Rosen. Is Demar that Rosen. Name? Yeah, yeah. Demar Rosen. His daughter yeah. shrieked every time yeah. a Raptor took a free throw, yep. and every single one of them missed. They did. Yeah. Yeah. Like night, they were down. They were up by nineteen points, and, yep. and uh, they missed an eighteenth free throws. Yep, and they lost by yeah. four or five. Yeah, it ought to be a law. And she was like sitting right up front, so it's like like her voice didn't carry because yeah, people were saying that like and they they posted it on uh, yeah the media today, but yeah. And even he caught, he was asked about it after the show. He says, I guess I owe her some money. <laughs> well, and somebody asked because their next game, so the winner of that game goes to play Miami for who gets to, yeah. to be the eighth seed in the NBA the play Eastern in, Conference. They call it, right? This is the play-in, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, somebody asked him, hey, your daughter was like clearly a factor tonight. Are you taking her to Miami? He was like, no, she's going back to school. <laughs> like, I can't yeah. take her to Miami. <laughs> well, he did take her out of school for this. Yeah, right? well, but, but yeah. again, she, she was... Like, I don't know if she was born here, but she certainly raised part of her life here, too. So, Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, DeMar played here for a very long time is, and is still beloved, except for the fact that he just pantsed us last night. But to be fair, mm -hmm. he didn't pants us so much as they pants, pants themselves. That Raptors team was very, very, very inconsistent this year. I was not surprised at all to watch them go down in flames. They yeah. were a, yeah. a, a real... It's it. I look at the pieces on paper, and I think, God, this team should be so much better than they are, but... Something just did not work, and whatever it is, I hope they get rid of it for next year.
Well, I hate to say it, but I, I did post this earlier on a private Slack channel that um, if you if you're if you're surprised that a tr- professional Toronto team doesn't blow a lead, uh, it's been a tradition since 1967, with three exceptions. Hey, hey, 68, 68, 67. They won the cup. <laughs> well, since 67, you know, yeah. Yeah, since the day after they hoisted the cup. Exactly. Yeah. No, you're, you, I mean, well, you know, yeah, we, we, I mean, I guess it depends what you think of the Toronto Argonauts or Toronto FC. Well, the or... Argos are a different story. The Argos are, have, have win and, and the Toronto uh, TFC has won and, and we have the Toronto Six now who are now. Yeah, and the Toronto Rock Lacrosse Currently the world champions, I guess, and, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, we've had some champions, but uh, even the Marlies won a title, but we, we just haven't had uh, no Leafs title in... A long time, but yeah, I mean, I, I, one of my good friends at work is a, a huge Raptors fan too. We talk about them all the time. He and I have had the same discussion over for the past few years, which is, hey, remember like just a couple of years ago when they won a, like an NBA championship? Uh, yeah, we're like, we're fine. We're fine. Uh, that, that glow will last for a while. It's obviously it's never, never want to see your team lose, never want to see them uh, humiliated or disappoint or whatever. But didn't we just win a title in 2019? Like, I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, didn't and we also because of the pandemic, we had we had an extra extended uh, World Series championship. Right, it was like n- eighteen months or something like that. Right. Well, it's funny because we had an extended champion in the NBA because of the COVID pandemic, and we had an extended Blue Jays championship in '93 because '94 was the year that got canceled because of the uh, the baseball strike. So oh, right. we actually had the Blue Jays champions for three years in a row, even though they only won two titles because they didn't have a World Series champion in 94. Hmm. Interesting. But 94? Wow, that was a long time ago. Yeah, no, well, 92 and 93 were when, uh, I mean, you and I sat and watched 92 when they won. I think both of us were like, huh, I can't believe they won. I didn't even celebrate. I was like, huh, how about that? <laughs> I remember vividly, you and I were sitting down in the family room of that house in Oakville and, and, uh, we were watching the game, and it was in the ninth inning, and, you know, uh, Otis Nixon goes to bunt, Timlin jumps off the mound, throws it over to Joe Carter, and they're like, the Blue Jays win the World Series. I'm like, huh. The, the first time or the second time? The first time. Second time was uh, was when Carter hit the home run. But the first oh, time, right. first yeah, time yeah. Carter catches the ball at first base, and they're like, oh, Blue Jays win the World Series, then the World Series banner is going to fly north of the border for the first time. And I think we were all just kind of looking at each other like, did, did you know a Toronto professional team could win championships? <laughs> it really it was it was it was so it just felt like no this is the part where we get our hearts ripped out remember we always get our hearts ripped out yeah yeah so i mean the the first the uh, first opening day of blue jays at the cne stadium where they used to play when they first started mm. they had to clear the snow off the, the grass yeah oh wow yeah this is a picture a friend of mine posted a picture on uh on the facebook this morning my uh, my mom has told me on an, a few occasions that apparently she put that baseball game on our old black and white TV in 1977 and sat me down in front of it. And she said, I sat there quite enwrapped watching the first ever Blue Jays game as a, a three-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. So. I've heard that story about you in Star Wars. Oh, it's, it was the same year. It was, it was actually within short order. I watched the Blue Jays game one month and I watched the Star Wars like a couple months later. Yeah. And it was the first time you sat still for an hour and a half, and, and for and basically her her trick her trick was take him to the movie theater every week. Well, and she did. She used to just drop me at the movie theater with a can of coke and a baggie of popcorn and say, "I'll see you in a few hours. Watch as many as you like." That's <laughs> why I became such a big movie buff because I just yeah that was that was her solution was go go enjoy. Have well, fun. that was back in the day when you could sit in the theater and watch the same movie over and over again. Oh, you could sit there or they do double bills or again, you could just yeah. theater hop. Like, you, you know, you go in to watch one thing and yeah, I, I seriously, she used to drop me off when she went to do her grocery shopping or, or fabric yeah. shopping as, as the case may be. She would drop me off at the theater and I would just watch two, sometimes three movies in a row. But wait, 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 this could go out publicly. You were 13 then, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes i was definitely of a legal age to be left alone i wasn't six <laughs> but uh yeah no it was uh it was good i mean again i no complaints on my side if the choices were go hang out with my mom at a fabric store or like go and watch you know the muppet movie or you know cannonball run or you know goonies or you know insert early 80s movie here uh yeah i would have taken the movies 100 times out of time 
again, at that point, to see a matinee in the theater, I think it was like for kids admission was like two bucks, two and a half bucks. Like mm-hmm, it was mm-hmm. money well spent on all accounts. And that's why I've yeah. seen Star Wars, like without exaggeration, probably 200 plus times. Yeah. I don't would, know if I've seen it that many times, but I've seen it a few times. Would I do it again? Maybe not 200 times, but you know. Yeah. I love it when the kids say things like, oh, there's nothing to watch. I'm like, really? I remember back in my day before there was <laughs> on demand or DVDs or VHS tapes. Yeah, definitely. So next week is the uh, is the big week. Two fun finales in two days. It's going to be fun. Mm. Is that the finale for more than just code for a while or the podcast for a while? I guess that's the question. I mean, the next thing that's coming up after these two end is visions. And I don't know if we want to get together and talk about visions. Uh, and, the, especially now. and the young Jedi adventures, the, uh, Padawan patrol, as I've been calling it, uh, is coming out at the same time, but n- neither of those really knock my socks off. But, uh, nope. yeah, the next thing after that is secret invasion. Um, so, and I guess Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is coming in the theaters. So yeah, I guess we can decide whether we want to dip back in for that stuff. I don't know. Is it, is it going to affect our numbers? You said our numbers were doing well no, uh, lately. Well, no, it's not, not really going to affect them. No. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think it's a fluke that we're we're getting to be where we are. Now, now, now. Maybe people just finally discovered us. Yeah. I'm looking at my uh, list here, and uh, it's possible to do, like, a, you know, a bit of a hiatus, but then, like, a little a little break of, like, oh, hey, we're, we're back to do a recap episode. Because there's some smaller things, like Beavis and Butthead Season 2 starts on April 20th. Hmm? Star Wars Visions May Fourth, Guardians of the Galaxy May. 5th. Wait, did you say Beavis and Butthead? Yeah, yeah season two is hilarious. I'm sorry, not Beavis and Butthead. Mike judges Beavis and Butthead yeah, exactly. because if you search I only for Beavis the and Butthead, one, so Paramount Plus is dumb yeah. enough to not give you the newer one. If you yeah. only search for Beavis and Butthead, you have to start with Mike judges Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> um, uh, Spider Man Across the Spider Verse on June second, and then. The the next thing that's the most obvious to go back into the the weekly is Star Trek Strange New World season two on yeah. June fifteenth. Yeah, yeah, I so, figured that's where we would come back for a full run. Yeah, so it sounds like you know a bit of a hiatus, but then we can play it by ear. And be like, hey, you know, we've got thoughts, we've collected enough stuff, and do kind of a recap of uh, what's happened. Yeah, Just and if they do one of these. What we've kind of data dump things where they're like, Hey, a new series announcements is something that we were really into. We can always dip back in, but uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to need to do a, any, you know, two hour episodes for a while. Right now. The new, I'm not going to be opposed to that. <laughs> the, the new episode of the uh, uh, Canadian health information podcast dropped this morning. I hope you both downloaded it and uh, listened to it and enjoyed it. We talked about virtual healthcare this time. Lots of interesting really? stuff. Where we're at, where we're going, and why it's going to be so damned expensive. Where are we going? Well, nowhere fast, unless we get some money into the system. Mm. We had this really cool doc from uh, Northwest Territories come on who basically has spent his entire career trying to create a proper virtual care system for one of the most remote areas, territories of Canada, and talked about what he's learned and how, you know, we have a lot of work to do. But isn't that the same? You had somebody from Northwest Territories on before, right? Same person? Uh, no, I had somebody on from Yukon uh, last year who oh, was talking Yukon, about right. uh, she's the only pediatrician in Yukon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. We have good guests. You know what I'm saying? We, we, get, good, we get good folks. As opposed on. to guests we have? <laughs> How many? We've, we've, we've had two guests, I think, I can think of. Well, technically, you are a guest. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I'm just a guest who's been on for like 150 episodes. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. I, I know how to overstay a welcome. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we, we've had uh, number one fans been on a few episodes and we had... Um, Tammy's been on one. Tammy. Yeah, yeah. Tammy. George has been on one. Who was? Yeah. George. Oh, that's right. George joined us once. There you go. There's three. I think that might be yeah. it, though. I don't think we've mm-hmm. had anybody else. It's an exclusive club. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you guys let me know if you don't want me to come back for any more guest spots, you know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we found a new, a new pattern. It's like family matters, but like pre-Urkel and then after Urkel. It's like, oh, actually, this is where it gets really popular. And this is the show that everybody <laughs> remembers. Yeah. <laughs> it was finding its way before. Yeah. Wait a minute. Did you just call me the Urkel of this show? <laughs> <laughs> I think he did. I'm not sure how to feel about that. I mean, I'm going to think about that one for a bit.
just getting smacked in the face with that praise. You know, that's the, yeah. the metaphor yeah. to go with there. Was it uh, the line from Ted Lasso last week? Was uh, it's a compliment sandwich? You put one good <laughs> thing around. Uh, two good things around one bad oh, that's, thing. That's an old trick. Yeah. That's an old manager trick. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You really, really add a lot to the show, Jonathan, but you talk too much. <laughs> but the fans really like you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Have you guys been keeping up with, with Ted Lasso? I, I, haven't watched, I, have, yeah. I haven't watched this week's, but I'm up to date to, to uh, yeah, the last one I watched was the Manchester City one. I see. I see. The, the thing that's been interesting for me that isn't, too spoilery because it sounds like you've covered just about everything you would need is like in my opinion it kind of feels like uh ted's ex is like an increasing train wreck the more yeah. that we mm. find out and then i'm like but then at the same time she's also kind of a victim of mm. the therapists you know like there's been so many therapists yeah. that said yeah that would either be illegal depending on where you are or heavily frowned upon as as being a, a moral and ethical problem so yeah oh because she's you know, having a relationship with her therapist or with the marriage counselor. The Yeah, the marriage counselor with her, which is a problem for him, right? Of like, yeah. you know, that's your patient. But then on top of that, other people said also she was seeing that guy as the as her own therapist. And like, yeah, that's kind of weird. You normally don't have your own personal therapist become your couple's therapist. So, yeah, that seems oh, like bad that ethics was, uh, too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. This, this dude seems like he was probably, you know... Working his way in. Yeah, yeah. working his way in. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. Stranger things have happened. So mm-hmm. they haven't confirmed it anywhere that I've seen, but I have I had heard uh, they said during the, the hiatus between seasons two and three that three was intended to be the final season. I don't think... Yeah, no, no. I, I saw a couple of interviews, oh. actually, Jonathan, <laughs> on that subject. Yeah. But, um, yeah, what's the, the writer, Brent... Um... Oh, Goldstein, plays... Brett, Brett Goldstein, yeah. The guy who plays Roy, uh, Roy, yeah. Yeah, he was on a couple of shows. He was on a show last week, and, and they asked him, and he, he just sort of said, they they were all kind of saying, we're not really sure. Yeah. He, he says, like, get Apple on the phone kind of thing, is what he's been saying, right? So. Well, it's funny, because, I mean, there's still half a season to go. Or I think this week was halfway of 6 of 12. Yeah. And yeah. so maybe there's a way to stick the landing in a satisfying fa- fashion, but... I don't know. It's it to me having just watched the first five. I don't really feel like this is drawing to a conclusion in any way, unless unless the conclusion is just Ted realizing that he's the team's better off without him and going back to Kansas. I, I which would be a I think a bit of a disappointment after all this. But yeah, well, you know, I think you have to watch the next episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, obviously the one I just watched is the one where you know his son is hanging out with his, you know with his ex-wife's you know yeah. whatever and, yeah. yeah and you know and he he gets into the bullying thing and yeah so it uh yeah i could definitely see that stuff building but uh yeah the son actually is funny so the son seems to have a pretty good head on his shoulder you know in, as a character i don't know but because he, he he does listen he does take his dad's advice right so yeah yeah this this last episode was kind of interesting with lots of dynamics in there yeah i was uh Surprised by the twist with uh, with Keeley last episode, the one I watched with uh, where she ends up with her financier. That was a, an unusual twist. What do you mean? Well, the fact that she's like still hasn't really gotten over Roy, and then she ends up uh, making out with uh, Jack, the the financier guy. Uh, okay, girl, right? yeah. was that, that that was this week's episode? Was that this yeah, week's you're, episode? You're you're all caught up if you saw. Oh, that. I am caught up. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. no. Zava, Zava's left the, the yeah, team. Yeah, right? yeah. So I thought that I thought there was one, one more this week. I couldn't. We just we've always been behind. I just assumed that I was still one behind. No, no, you're you're caught up. This okay. is that's what that was yesterday's episode. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, good. Hey, yeah, I'm up to date. That's what I was trying. I was trying to get around the fact that you know that that you know um, what's his name the the advisor to what's her name comes in and says, oh, we may have to fire Ted. Yeah, we may have to fire Ted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, maybe possibly if you know whatever. Yeah, and then and then uh, this uh, the the bad care the young assistant coach dude I forgot his name Shelley. Um, gets oh, Nate! Finally yeah. gets the girl. Yeah, yeah. Nate, oh, Nate. Yeah, the girl he's been trying to impress at the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just love her the way she just deadpan looks at him whenever he tries to talk to her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that that scene with him and the supermodel was very funny. 
Yeah. She's like, he's like, like, you need to take your purse and your phone and your coat to go to the washroom. Yeah. Yeah. And then she runs across the street. (laughs) We're going to have to charge you for the booze. Yeah. I wonder if that's, uh, yeah. I wonder if he just has some like epiphany in uh, this season and decides to go back to Richmond. There's, there's certainly an arc there of like, like in his, in his anger last season, he, you know, he reveals to Trent Krim about the, the panic attacks and he tears the believe sign. And in this season he had the, you know, the rematch Mm -hmm. or I guess the first match of, uh, between, between the two sides. And he doesn't uh, shake hands at the end of the game. Yeah. And you think at the time, like, oh, it's because he's, you know, thumbing his nose at yeah, at, being a jerk, uh, yeah, at Ted. And then when they interview and tell him, like, hey, you didn't. He's like, wait, no, I, I, I did, I didn't. Oh, I, I guess I, you know, in in my enthusiasm or, or in the moment, he just missed it. So the way his character breaks a little bit makes it seem like, oh, he didn't even realize that he had snubbed his uh, his former coach. So. I do feel like he probably will have some some sort of, you know, understanding with Ted at the end of this, or some, you know, reconciliation of some sort. Um, well, and certainly I mean, the the way that his own boss yeah. treats him is like so uh, toxic. Yeah, you know that that it's like yeah, he, he, there's no way he could work for that guy forever. Yeah, and I, I do feel like they've been telegraphing a little bit with the whole they're struggling in the coach's room, right? Like they're, they're struggling, you know, between beard and, and, uh, Roy and Ted, they, they aren't doing well with their strategy. And they're like, something's missing, something's missing, something's missing. And I felt like that was very much like what's missing is, is Nate, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he has a heart to heart with that cute girl from the, the restaurant and snaps back to his good senses. Yeah, but how could he? Would, how could he go back to being? He can't go back to being an assistant coach, though. No, but maybe he becomes the the head coach as he should have been. Oh, I see. He right, yeah. he takes over right. for Ted, and Ted, you know, is like, oh, this is how it was meant to be. You should be the coach here, and I'll I'll be your assistant, or you know, something like that. Hmm. hmm. Or Ted yeah, goes you, back to Kansas. Who knows? You give a different role to to Ted because Ted is not like a tactician, clearly for yeah. For this he's a sort motivator. Yeah, yeah, the motivator is exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've worked with people like that. Not so good with the work part, but boy, they help other people get my work done. Yeah, what to say? Anyway, I guess we should uh, pack it up. Yep. Get All right. Talk, Talk to time. you guys later. All right. Talk to you next week. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.